Good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you to this IIEA webinar. My name is Una Fitzpatrick. I'm the Director of Technology Ireland and IBEC Trade Association, and I'll be chairing today's event. Today's event is part of a series organised by the IEA and IDA Ireland to explore digital policy issues relevant to Ireland. Today's event follows the Digital Ireland Conference, which took place in Dublin Castle in November. Today's event is on the hot topic of transatlantic data transfers, and we're delighted to be joined by our expert panel, who have been generous enough to take time out of their schedules to speak to us. Each panelist will speak to us for about 10 minutes or so. Um, after each panelist has finished their presentations, we'll then go to a Q&A with our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send us your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll come to them after the panel have finished their presentations. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. I encourage you to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. I will now formally introduce our speakers and hand over to them. We are going to be joined by Christopher Hoff, Assistant General Counsel for Privacy and Regulatory Affairs at Microsoft, former US Deputy Secret Assistant Secretary in the Department of Commerce. Then by John Miller, Senior Vice President for Policy, Trust, Data and Technology at the Information Technology Industry Council, ITI. Anne Marie Bowen, Head of Technology and Innovation Group at Matheson. And finally, we'll be joined later by Bruno Giancarelli, Head of Unit for International Data Flows and Protection in the European Commission. So first up, it's my pleasure to introduce Christopher Hoff. Christopher is currently the Assistant General Counsel for Privacy and Regulatory Affairs at Microsoft. He was previously the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Services, Industries and Analysis at the US Department of Commerce until June 2022. In this role, he was involved in negotiating the new EU-US data privacy framework and also worked on the data flows relationship with the UK and Switzerland and on globalizing the former APEC cross-border privacy rules system. He was previously the Chief Privacy Officer for Huron Consulting Group. It's over to you now, Christopher. Thanks so much, Anna, uh, and thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm going to go over uh, a little bit of background of the negotiation and uh, the result of it that um, everyone's pretty well aware of now, uh, as well as uh, infusing some global perspective there. You mentioned some of the other work that, that I've, I've done uh, and worked on before, um, but, but that, that pretty well covered uh, why I'm here today. I was part of the negotiation. Um, I was the, the lead for the Department of Commerce where the, the program sits, the data privacy framework is managed by the Department of Commerce um, as the privacy shield and safe harbor before it were as well. Uh, so that's why there's a Department of Commerce person um, there at the negotiation table. Um, but it was a group effort. It was, a, you know, there was somebody from the White House leading. Uh, there was also Department of Justice lawyers, Office of Director of National Intelligence lawyers, um, and State Department and representatives from the intelligence community agencies as well, because the negotiation, as you know, was focused not on the commercial principles of, of then Privacy Shield, but on very, very limited issues that were raised by the Court of Justice of the European Union um, in 2020 in the Schrems II case. Um, so it took, speaking of 2020, it took some time for the negotiation to take place. It was two years long. Um, it was a, a hard fought battle between the, the commission and the US government. Um, now we are on the same side. We've come to, a, a, I think, a very good agreement between us uh, and a new framework that we are confident um, meets the Schrems to CJEU uh, requirements that were laid out for us. So in the negotiation, the entire time, everybody sat at the table with the CJEU opinion in front of them. Uh, used it as a checklist for what needed to be done. Uh, truly, it wasn't. It's not figurative. We were we were sitting there with it, um, and it took a, a great deal of time. And it was very constant. There were there were no lulls in it. Um, there was a change in administration uh, from the beginning. Twenty twenty, we had a different president, um, but they started the negotiation then. Um, I started on day one of the administration. The White House person was there on day one of the. The Biden administration as well. Um, and so it's been constant work since then. And even after we came to the agreement, which had its own uh, you know, 20 page term sheet that we had worked on, it had to be translated into 
uh, into US law, which is where the executive order and the Department of Justice regulation that came with it came from. Um, and that took extra time as well. By the time I left in June, we had negotiated the whole deal, agreed on it, um, drafted most of the executive order. Um, the Department of Justice had drafted most of the DOJ regulation. Um, but as you know, it, it, you didn't see an executive order in June, you saw one in, on October 7th, um, because there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of agencies that had to change, um, what they were doing, um, and, and incorporate new policies and procedures. Um, and that's why it took so long because these were substantial changes to U.S. law. There are substantial changes to agency policy and in the intelligence community, um, and so that that leads me into the the meat of of what's in the the executive order and Department of Justice regulation. Um, they are both, uh, you know, somewhere they're medium length, uh, but they are worth reading uh, for for everyone who's interested. Um, they're very worth reading. They're uh, you know somewhat complicated as as law is, but. Uh, but they've got really good information in there. It's it's worth um, reading those and, and not simply relying on news articles, although there have been a lot of good ones. Um, because it goes through a, a number of key things that that didn't exist under Privacy Shield, under the arrangement before this one. Um, it improves on PPD 28, the presidential policy directive um, from the Obama years that, uh, that was implemented around the Privacy Shield one time. Um, and it, it goes into what necessity and proportionality mean. It uses those terms for the first time, um, EU legal terms, uh, if, in terms of you know, intelligence surveillance activities being uh, you know, using only ones that are necessary and proportionate in terms of data privacy as well. Um, the executive order and the regulation create a brand new redress system that um, is a whole cloth new. Um, there's a new data protection review court. They created a court out of, uh, of thin air, and that took a great deal of time and legal work. Um, and both of those things are, you know, noting sort of at the outset, in the instruments that they're in because of the subject matter. So there's, there's I, I've seen some concern over whether there's a statute that, that implements these things versus executive order. Um, you know, there's there, this thought that perhaps an executive order is not as durable. Um, I would challenge that at the outset by saying that national security in the US constitutional system is largely uh, in the purview of the executive branch. Executive orders are where the executive creates some law that agencies have to follow. Um, national security issues are, by and large, in executive orders. For example, EO 12333, uh, which was challenged by the CJEU in the Schrems II decision. Um, that's from 1981, from President Reagan. Uh, and it has lasted. It's, it's been updated. It's been improved, but it's durable. Those instruments are generally where things like this go. So it wasn't just a matter of ease because that this wasn't easy, um, <laughs> and uh, not just a matter of uh, preferring it over a statute. It's where, because of the separation of powers, a lot of national security things stay in the executive. Um, so that's there. There's a Department of Justice regulation that goes with it. It's not all in the executive order. There's a regulation that goes with it because the Attorney General needed to create a, a, a regulation of its own um, that created the court because it's relying on the attorney general's authority to establish the court. It's using the attorney general's special counsel authority um, to set up the three judge panel um, and the, the rules and of the court. Um, so that's why it's in a separate instrument. We tried to put as much as we could into the executive order and did. Um, so that it would be in one place, uh, but that DOJ regulation is necessary as well and worth reading. Um, so those are all in there. The, the redress mechanism was the uh, most difficult thing to deal with. Necessity and proportionality were, were slightly less challenging from a legal perspective. Um, and you'll notice from the executive order, there's some nice legitimate objectives laid out, prohibited, object, prohibited objectives. Um, and intelligence activities have to be necessary to advance those validated intelligence priorities. 
you know, be more proportionate to the validated intelligence priorities. Um, but then there's a large, uh, large chunk of the executive order and regulation that are focused on the new court system. Um, and so it starts with the Office of Director of Intelligent, National Intelligence's Civil Liberties Protection Officer as a fact finder. The executive order provides more independence um, uh, around that function uh, than, than even they already had um, and creates uh, um, you know, a rule that the uh, CLIPOs, the Civil Liberties Protection Officers uh, findings are binding, their decisions are binding on the intelligence community. The Data Protection Review Court then can hear um, the case there's a special counsel involved in that to make it even more court-like than just having three judge panels would be. Um, and their decisions are binding as well. They have independence from the executive and the, the executive is not allowed to influence them at any level, um, not even the attorney general or the president. Um, and then there's oversight of the entire system from the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, PCLOB. Um, they are an independent agency in the United States government, so their function has generally is generally oversight. Um, they write reports, they do investigations, um, and so they, the P Club, has um, been asked to serve as an oversight mechanism for the entire thing to ensure that the court is operating well. Um, and all of these things are significantly different than. Um, not only do we think that they that they completely address the CJEU's trans two decision, um, but that's they're significantly different. And they, there's the perspective that I want to keep coming back to is that this is uh, quite different than the previous operation where the state ombudsperson, who was not binding on the intelligence community and who was not terribly independent from the executive, was the previous redress mechanism. Um, it's also very similar to what is happening uh, in most member states in practice as well. There is, uh, you know, I've seen some concern over the fact that there's a bit of a boilerplate answer that individuals will get because of national security after the end of the case, which is, you know, is sort of um, if proper procedures weren't followed, it was corrected um, answer. And that's because of state secrets. We're talking about you know very sensitive national security issues, um, but the perspective part of that is that that is what they what uh, you know a, an individual citizen of France, for example, would receive from the Camille if the Camille took something to the intelligence community agencies in France um, and and said you know we've got a complaint from an individual um, if there was intelligence collection activities on them were they properly followed. And then the, it would trickle back to the individual and they would get that similar sort of response. So um, this is, it's pretty typical. Um, realizing that, that I've already taken 10, 10 minutes on that overview, I was gonna briefly mention that um, even though this is a transatlantic data flows panel, um, I'm looking forward to hearing, um, and, and John might talk about this as well, and Marie on some of these other topics, but. There's some OECD work going on. There's trusted government access principles that we're hoping to see soon. Um, there are global solutions, which I think is uh, a really important thing to note that the, the transatlantic conversation does and has for almost a decade sucked all of the air out of the room in data flows conversations. And I'm looking forward to a day when we're talking about more global things more often, like the global cross-border privacy rules that um, you know, Australia, Canada, Japan, Korea, Mexico, the Philippines, Singapore, Chinese Taipei, and the U.S. are already in, and that Latin America is interested in. The U.K. is at the table in those discussions as well. Um, so those are really important things to, to look forward in, to in the future. But I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you so much, Christopher. And uh, definitely, I think uh, the global solutions is is it might come up in, in our Q and A discussion, and and I'd be welcome to get the insights from all the panel. Um, so I'm delighted now to introduce John Miller. John is Senior Vice President of Policy, Trust, Data and Technology and General Counsel and currently leads ITI's Trust, Data and Technology Policy Team, driving ITI's strategy and advocacy on cybersecurity, privacy and data protection, supply chain security and resilience, government access to data, digital platforms, artificial intelligence, internet of things, cloud computing and other technology and digital policy issues. 
that's a that's a serious long list, John. So uh, I'll, I'll credit you for for tackling all that. Um, but uh, I'm delighted to hand over to you and welcome your comments. Uh, thank, thanks very much, um, and, and and thanks very much uh, for the uh, 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 you know the the invitation uh, today. Um, you know, um, in a way, Chris said it all, uh, but uh, I, I I will so I will try not to repeat what uh, you know any any of what Chris said. But you know, I think I I do think um, one one place to start here is is just to give a really brief introduction to to who ITI is and then connect that to the some of the broader business interests and then get a little more into this. I mean, you know, ITI we we are the Information Technology Industry Council. We're headquartered in Washington DC, but we have offices in Brussels and in other capitals around the world, and we really represent the the breadth of the tech sector, so you know, hardware companies, software companies, various different types of services companies, networking equipment companies, B2C companies, but but also B2B companies. And I mean, I think one thing that that certainly um, connects every, all of these companies together is that they're all using data in one fashion or another. They're all certainly interested in protecting that that data um, as well and, and, in, and in transferring that data and, and you know, uh, innovating right um around that data and i mean i think it's fair to say that the tech sector itself is is a kind of a horizontal enabler really across the entire economy right now and so the i mean one thing i wanted to just say at the outset is uh, to kind of um maybe dismiss what is also maybe a popular misconception about this whole area is that um I, i'm here representing the tech sector but I, I feel very sure in saying that this is an issue transatlantic data flows and indeed global data flows as chris suggested that impacts all companies um companies in the eu companies in the us companies around the world um companies in every sector um and you know indeed companies of of, of every size um you know uh, one, one one thing to note about the the, the predecessor privacy shield framework, as I know Chris knows well, is that I think at, at least 70% of the companies that were certified to privacy shield are, are small and medium sized businesses, right? And, and, and those are thousands of, of, of companies. Um, and the reason I can say I, that, that I know this with certainty is because, you know, ITI recently led a um, transatlantic multi association letter with over 40 associations from, uh, uh, you know, Really, an equal number from the U.S. and the uh, uh, EU, uh, including across the member states, um, and really just representing every sector of the economy. Um, really, and and I think that that's important to to just again, not only demonstrate that this is an issue that's important to every company in in the modern economy, but it, it it's one of the reasons why. And, and you know, you've seen these numbers thrown around, but uh, you know. Chris and the negotiators had a hard job because they not only had to develop a framework that would protect fundamental human rights in line with, um, uh, you know, the CJEU's decision, um, but they also, uh, you know, what's what's lurking in the background here is that we 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 need to figure out a way to facilitate data flows that underpin a seven point one trillion dollar economic relationship be, between the EU and the US, and and that's really important. And I think another really important fact here as well is that it you know it's not just about um fundamental human rights and economics um but you know the EU and the US are are trusted allies and partners and they require a data sharing framework that that upholds citizens fundamental rights you know for sure but but also provides the national security and intelligence authorities with necessary and proportionate tools to protect citizens public safety interests um, you know, and, and in particular at, at a time when some might argue shared democratic uh, values are increasingly under threat. Um, you know, moving on to the framework itself, um, you know, I, I think Chris went over a bunch of, of, of the key features of that and, you know, certainly happy to get into more details about both the necessity and proportionality um, and redress uh, solutions here. I think Chris also hit some some uh, you know important points about why NEO under U.S. law is actually very um, you know preferable, arguably to, to to legislation. But but I think that raises another issue, and and I I just wanted to, and I think Chris alluded to this, but I did want to underscore this, you know, and and why the negotiators took two years and why this was such a difficult task, you know, because if we take a step back, the, the negotiators, you know, as Chris said, they, they needed to craft a solution. 
that was consistent with EU law and in particular the Court of Justice's decision in Schrems II. And they 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 referred to that um, you know constantly. Uh, it, it 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 sounds like. Um, but they also needed to craft a solution that was consistent with U.S. constitutional law and protections. Um, you know, so we've got the EU Charter and this Court of Justice, we've got the U.S. Constitution and agreement uh, that that was kind of now has now been reflected in that in that law is um, or. And, and it is law is 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 very um uh you, you know important and it, and I think it's important to to also just um uh stress that um you know even though there is important work that still needs to be done to fully operationalize um some of the provisions of the executive order uh and you know setting up the court in totality um it, it's important to stress that the you know US law changed when the executive order was signed by the president and i think the commission even in its in its faq uh document that was published um i think on the same day you know uh talked about um the fact that uh you know the changes um were uh you know were significant um and 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 constitute legal changes right then and they also uh, stress that the safeguards that were agreed to here um, and, and that are reflected in the executive order, um, you know, are, are, are not only available in the context of the privacy shield and what is now going to be called the EU-US data privacy framework, but they're actually relevant because they reflect legal changes on the US side to all transfers um, to the US under the GDPR, you know, and that and that's including standard contractual clauses. And, and I really do think that's an important point because as important as this new data privacy framework is, um, it's still, I don't know, something like 90% of all transfers are actually being trans uh, using other transfer mechanisms such as SCCs. And so, um, you know, it's important that this agreement is also going to stabilize transatlantic data transfers writ large. Um, you know, Chris teed up the, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the need for, I think, a global solution here, ultimately, um, and, uh, you know, also reference some some important work going on um, at the OECD. So, I, I, you know, I, I would like to, uh, you know, hit the ball that that, that he teed up and, and talk about that just a little bit. Um, you know, the OECD has been working on um, really for, I think, almost a couple of years now. Uh, developing principles on trusted government access to private sector data. Um, you know, they, you know, if, if, if we just go briefly into the history here, you know, this actually traces back to um, some work at the G20 back in 2019 um, when Japan was uh, chairing that and in, in the so-called um, uh, Osaka track. They, uh, they 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 kicked off kind of a major international initiative on data flows, uh, and and the, and in particular um, wanted to express a shared commitment to upholding democracy and the, and the rule of law, um, uh, you know, pr protecting privacy and under and other fundamental human rights and freedoms, um, but but also promoting data free flows with trust is what they called it there. And um, I think it's it, it, it's instructive that that so that work has been going on at least since 2019. And I think there, is, there there's a common thread that goes through to what the OECD has been working on the past couple of years, uh, which is an acknowledgement, you know, number one of, of, of the need for a multilateral global conversation on these issues. Um, but 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 also to, to really um, put a fine point on it, you know, to, to focus on what the commonalities are between the systems of the US, of course, but also all the other OECD uh, uh, democracies, um, the, the EU member states, Japan, Australia, the UK, uh, and others. And, uh, you know, they, they've, as we understand it, it's been a closed confidential process to, to be sure, but as we understand it, they've made very good progress and there is an OECD ministerial uh, next week, where we are certainly hopeful that they will be um, 
uh, announcing that they that they have um, you know agreed to principles, uh, best practices, legal guarantees, um, you know, to ensure trusted government access that that exists in the in, in the various different OECD members. Um, you know, th those principles again, as we understand it, will address some of the very same issues that are um, at play in the TREMS two conversation. Uh, and and in the context of the the EO and the DOJ regulations that we've been talking about, you know things like um, necessity uh, and proportionality, um, uh, of course redress, uh, transparency, as well uh, independent oversight, and you know I think uh, I, I and certainly ITI and our members are, are certainly hopeful that um, when those principles are published, and again they're not binding, but when those principles are published, I think it'll actually really help to provide a lot more transparency into what all of these other you know, trusted governments um, and democratic allies of, of the EU and the US, as, as well as the EU and US are doing in this space. Because as, as Chris also mentioned, so much of the focus has been almost exclusively on, on US practice in this area for almost a decade now. Um, and, and one of the ironies, perhaps, of this whole debate is that we probably have more transparency into what the U.S. is doing than anyone else. So I think that the OECD work will hope, hopefully start, you know, widening the aperture and, and really making this a global conversation so we can talk about the importance of global data flows uh, as well as transatlantic data flows. So I'll stop there. I'm over time. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. And absolutely, I definitely think we, we'll, we'll be picking up um, on, on some of those points uh, during our Q&A. So our third speaker, I'm delighted to introduce is Anne-Marie Bowen, who has over 20 years experience in technology related legal matters and is the head of Matheson's Technology and Innovation Group and a member of our Asset Management and Investment group, Funds Group. Anne-Marie brings together significant practical experience in advising on technology and pri privacy uh, legal issues with industry knowledge and an understanding of applicable regulatory rules and regulatory requirements. She advises on all aspects of technology and e-commerce law, as well as outsourcing and contract services, with particular focus on the requirements of financial institutions and financial service providers in these areas. Over to you, Anne-Marie. Thanks, Una, and uh, thanks as well to um, IIEA and IDA for the invitation to speak this afternoon. I think I'm going to come at it from a slightly different perspective to John and Chris in that, you know, I, I'm looking at it as a practitioner. So this is really around some of the on the ground challenges that we've seen facing clients in relation to international transfers generally. So just picking up on the comments that uh, both John and Chris made you know, this is not purely a transatlantic issue. And I was glad to hear them both reference that because these are challenges that face not just Irish businesses, but EU businesses generally in relation to international transfers across the board and to multiple jurisdictions. I think it's important, I think at the outset to acknowledge, um, and we're all very conscious of the 27 December date coming up for implementation of the new SCCs, but I do think it's important to acknowledge that they've actually been quite helpful in terms of issues that businesses are facing um, transferring data internationally. I think some of the key issues there that have been helpful have been the modular form of the SCCs. And I think in particular, the, the um, processor to processor and processor to controller uh, SCCs that were introduced, the docking provision, which allows you know, additional companies to sign up to the, the SCCs in terms of flow down are also helpful. And the fact that you know, you're now covered for Article 28, where you use the uh, export to processor SCCs um, is also, again, very helpful. There is absolutely no doubt that when we get the new EU US privacy framework, that that's absolutely going to assist as well. You know, it's going to remove some of the uncertainties that have existed since Schrems 2, notwithstanding that we have those new SCCs. Now, that's only going to apply to the US, obviously. And, you know, as we've heard, you know, there are broader um, challenges in terms of international transfers. Um, but those two are, developments have been really quite helpful from a business perspective. That said, there are challenges that do remain. And I think, you know, I'm going to focus a little bit on the SCCs because, as, as John mentioned, they, they are probably the most common form of safeguarding mechanism that's implemented when we're talking about international transfers. Um, so while the new ones are certainly an improvement, we have seen challenges in, in terms of implementing those new ones because we're not really replacing like with like because of those new modules. 
So in some instances, it's caused a reopening of contracts and particularly liability allocations. So, you know, if, if you take, for example, you have an existing uh, controller to processor arrangement and you now think it's more makes more sense to have a processor to processor arrangement that pushes the responsibility onto the processor as exporter. So it is leading to sort of dis opening discussions and renegotiations around liability, around risk there. My own sense as well is while for on a go forward basis, it's really helpful to have Article 28 covered in the, the export to processor SCCs. Um, where you've an existing contract in place, you may have negotiated some very some, some very specific provisions within the confines of Article 28 and, and meeting its requirements, where they now may be overridden by more general SCC terms. So I think that there may be challenges um, for businesses and organizations um, coming up. But I think it, you know it's not simply a question of filling in and executing those SCCs. Um, there's a lot of operational pieces that go that need to be put in place around this. And I think probably the single most challenging element of TREMS and the resulting EDPB recommendations from a practical perspective is, is the issue of transfer impact assessments and the degree to which business has now become responsible for that. Um, and that's particularly in, in relation to assessing the laws of a particular jurisdiction that, that you want to export data to. So, you know, if you take a step back and you look at the commission adequacy decisions, huge resources and time go into undertaking those analyses. Um, and at least when you get an adequacy decision, there's certainty for the exporter that the transfer is within the confines of GDPR and it, it, it's valid under GDPR. With a transfer impact assessment, you're effectively pushing that work onto the exporter. Um, so there's a need to get local legal advice to understand what the legal position is in that jurisdiction. It, it, it's not just around law um, and, and practice, but you know it, it is looking at all of the security issues as well. Um, but that's been a real challenge, I think, for businesses in terms of understanding the extent of the analysis they need to do, what investigations they need to do. So having some kind of template TIA with more detailed guidance would be welcomed by industry. Um, I think Chris made a very valid point in relation to the executive order, and, and that is that it's immediately relevant to these transfer impact assessments when you're analyzing transfers to the US. Um, but as I said at the outset, this is a broader issue than just transatlantic um, transfers. It does um, apply much more broadly. One of the other challenges I think we've seen um, is that where we've got businesses offering what are essentially commoditized offerings, so cloud may be one example, the processor in that instance, or, or the importer, whether it's a processor or a controller, very often leads the analysis in terms to supplemental measures, in terms to transfer impact assessments. Um, Schrems to the decision there made it very clear that the responsibility rests with the exporter. So particularly, I think, challenging for SMEs, where, where they are looking to use what are essentially commoditized services, and they are more reliant and more dependent on what the importer is telling them but still are taking on the risk and the responsibility. So, so that again is, is a little bit of a challenge. It's really a one size fits all solution. Um, so you know, some more nuance in terms of guidance, I think for SMEs in terms of guidance for some of those products would always uh, be helpful. The, the SCCs are, as I said, the most common safeguarding mechanism um, that we've seen. I think it's important to acknowledge that there are others. So BCOR is binding corporate rules, which apply on an intergroup basis um, are, there they're useful they, they take time to get through and, and they're very complex um, and you still may need a series of SCCs sitting alongside them um, depending on what how your data data flows I think one of the other challenges that that I've seen and that um, I have to say can be a little bit frustrating sometimes um, GDPR does contain derogations in relation to international transfers um, so there are a number of circumstances um, where you can rely on, on a derogation. There's been guidance from the EDPB, which has really narrowed down the circumstances in which you can rely on those. And that, that's not always helpful um, in terms of some of those uh, exemptions. And, and it would give more flexibility if that could be revisited in terms of looking at, um, it's, it's relatively technical, but they've applied a, a subparagraph at the end to all of the exemptions. My reading of it is it shouldn't be applied that broadly, but that's, that's a different conversation <laughs> for a different day. Um, I think then, you know, the, the, the other area that we've seen tensions arise, and it goes to the, the points that both Chris and John were making around 
um, the fact that we need an international multi-jurisdictional conversation around this and the work that the OECD is doing, I think will help with this, but it is that tension between legal systems. So it, it is the, what we call long arm effect of laws in certain jurisdictions where they apply to um, companies established in that jurisdiction, but also to their international subsidiaries. It puts pressure on both the, the, the local company, but also the international subsidiary in terms of trying to comply with that and, and having an international framework where there are um, government to government or you know, public authority um, frameworks that would allow for that pressure to be taken off business and, and, and for it to be dealt with through those mechanisms. So the mutual assistance um, mechanisms that are currently there, I think would again help because we, we've seen in some instances some real tension there be between the, the legal systems. Um, I think anywhere that there's a lack of clarity, and we, we still have lack of clarity in certain areas, anything that the policymakers can do to assist with that and to giving more uh, guidance, more, more clear guidance and more structured guidance around um, the international transfers and, and how these mechanisms can work would be absolutely welcomed. There's a real risk for business. You know, there's, there's a huge amount of work and effort goes into doing these uh, assessments and into making sure that there is a safeguarding mechanism in place. But it's against a backdrop where sometimes you're not quite clear. And if you get it wrong, the, the implications are quite significant, both from a, a potential administrative sanction perspective, and um, but also just in terms of business and being told to stop doing what you're doing, which, which is always a potential as well. So I think, you know, um, just to summarize, I think, you know, the more certainty we can create the better, but that will will require multi-jurisdictional, multi-government discussions. And, and it, it is something that is bigger than business in, in the sense that they need that framework. Hand back to you, Una, thanks. Super, thanks so much, Amory. Um, great overview there. And definitely, um, I echo the comments around clarity and more, more guidance, um, definitely on the industry side, um, always, always most welcome. Um, I'm not sure if Bruno has joined us yet, um, so just in case he hasn't, maybe I'll kick off with, it, with a question um, and when I see him pop up, maybe he, we can, he, can, he can join us. Um, so my first question that's come in, uh, Christopher, is for you, and I suppose it's the question on um, kind of to some of your comments, what was the attitude of US intelligence agencies during the negotiations and, you know, did they express concerns about the kind of possible reforms or limits on intelligence gathering? <laughs> as much as you're allowed to answer, I think. Yeah, matter. right. Uh, there's, there's very little that I'd be allowed to say about that. Uh, <laughs> um, I totally understand the question, though. Um, I would say that uh, these were significant changes. And so uh, all of the agencies that were affected were, um, were well aware of how they would be affected. Um, and so... Uh, it definitely felt like more of an internal negotiation in the United States government than uh, oftentimes. I mean, of course, the um, it was a negotiation between the European Commission and the United States government, but the, the work that had to be done internally was its own very large negotiation. Uh, but it, it helped to have um, uh, such attention to it. Um, I was a... a political appointee, there was somebody else from the White House that was dealing with it, um, and then a whole host of, of amazing senior career executives who were dealing with it as well. So it was a, a, a huge team effort that required uh, a lot of buy-in and a lot of negotiation from the agencies. It was tricky. Can you imagine? Okay, one, one question maybe to, to all the panelists. Um, maybe could you comment further on the importance of the distinction between a formal data transfer framework to replace Privacy Shield on the one hand and the use of other mechanisms such as standard contract clauses, which I know has, has been mentioned a lot already um, on, on the other. So I suppose really, you know, the, what is the distinction for, for maybe somebody who, who might not understand? I, I can start off on that. <laughs> I think from a legal perspective, it, it really goes to the question of certainty, because if you're operating under what is essentially an adequacy decision, there's a, there's a comfort there that, yes, we all know they're subject to uh, CJEU review, 
and um, but there's a comfort there when you're you're operating under a framework or an adequacy decision that's been signed off by the commission because the commission has done the work in assessing the the uh, the risk Um, I suppose another question that's going, Christopher, I think you're being hit again. Um, I suppose it's in relation to, you know, to what extent, if any, have your has your perspectives changed um, on these issues since you've joined Microsoft? Um, <laughs> again, whatever you're allowed to say. <laughs> yeah, very great. Uh, well, because they both in both of these past jobs, uh, you're you're I've had to balance. Um, how much to say about very sensitive national security issues uh, for, as a government representative, a senior official there, uh, and then at Microsoft where uh, almost everyone in the world is a customer of ours. Um, I was joking with John about that yesterday. So, uh, but my perspective hasn't changed at all. Um, I, I think that, and that's not just about I mean, it, it sounds for a moment like I'm talking about my own integrity and in part I am, but the integrity of everyone who was involved in developing these new frameworks was really impressive. Everyone on the US side, everyone on the, the, the commission side, everyone was trying their hardest to, and very honestly talking to each other about solutions that would work. And the US government was trying to be as flexible as possible. And so I was genuinely excited about the, uh, the solutions that we came up with at the time. I'm still excited about them. Um, so, so not much has changed for me. Brilliant, thank you, Christopher. And uh, we might pause the Q&A there. I see uh, Bruno has joined us. So uh, good afternoon. And I'm delighted to, to introduce uh, Mr. Bruno Gincarelli as Deputy uh, to the Director for Fundamental Rights and Rule of Law and heads the International Data Flows and Protection Unit at the European Commission. Um, Bruno, I'll hand over to you to, to deliver some comments and we might have time then for some further Q&A. Yes, and uh, first, uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody to the audience and my co-panelists and I apologize for joining only now but um, what is keeping us busy this afternoon and probably the whole night is something that you have been discussing this is about um, uh, this is about uh, when we are going to table the draft uh, adequacy decision on the new uh, data privacy framework uh, so uh, it's never it's never good to be late but I think this time I have a good excuse um, and unfortunately I, I haven't followed and heard uh, what has been uh, uh, discussed uh, so far. I maybe will give some brief, uh, make some brief remark on uh, where we are and uh, why we believe this is important and then also try to start answering the question why we believe that this time this will work. Um, where we are, that's the simplest thing. Um, we are at the stage in which in the coming days, I don't yet have a, a date, uh, I think you have all, all of you have also read the, the press uh, so speculation that this is coming in, whether it's tomorrow, Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, this is coming and it's coming very soon. Uh, we will, uh, uh, following the adoption uh, by the US President and uh, US Attorney General of uh, respectively a uh, presidential executive order and an uh, Attorney General regulation that translate in US terms the political agreement that was announced by President Biden and, and von der Leyen, President Biden and von der Leyen on the 25th of uh, March of this year, uh, building on that, we propose uh, next week uh, an adequacy, uh, a draft adequacy decision. Uh, that will explain why we believe that uh, now we are in a position uh, to uh, consider that the requirements uh, set by the Court of Justice, our highest court in uh, the Schrems II judgment, are, are fulfilled. Um, that type of uh, decision, and, you know, we're talking about the complex instrument, it's not an international agreement, it's a unilateral decision uh, that the Commission uh, can adopt uh, on the basis of, of course, negotiation and, and, uh, and commitments taken uh, by the other side, the other party, in this case, the US. So that the adoption of that uh, decision uh, 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 needs to go to a multi-stage process, which uh, provides um, uh, uh, first of all, for uh, the need uh, requires uh, uh, an opinion, requires uh, uh, first uh, an opinion from the European Data Protection Board, which, as we know, uh, uh, brings together uh, the uh, independent regulators uh, of uh, uh, the, our member states. 
then once we uh, uh, obtain that opinion, uh, we go to use the uh, uh, Russell's uh, uh, jargon comitology process, which is a barbarian term to just indicate the fact that uh, uh, there's a committee uh, composed of representatives of the member states, 27 member states of the EU, that will have to uh, look at this decision uh, uh, and uh, uh, vote on this decision. And we need a positive vote of a majority, qualified majority, to use another uh, EU uh, term, a qualified majority of member states uh, uh, that uh, uh, would give us a, a green light, would, uh, would support uh, that draft decision. And uh, this process is also uh, subject to the uh, scrutiny of the European Parliament, which can uh, request uh, they uh, ask the Commission to either amend or even withdraw its, its proposal. Once that uh, process is, uh, all these steps have been done uh, and this, the process is completed, we, the European Commission, political leadership, the College of the European Commission, the College of Commissioners, can adopt the adequacy uh, decision. Next, your next question with the, yes, fine, but uh, how much time will this will take? When are we? Uh, uh, when do you expect uh, to have that decision? As you can imagine, uh, 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 all these steps are not fully under our control. Rightly so, and that's part of the healthy system of check and balances. They involve other institutional interlocutors uh, uh, that uh, uh, have um, control over their part of the process. So I, mean, I, I cannot give you a, 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 a already at this stage. A, a sure and certain uh, timeline, but we we have some indication that comes from uh, recent precedents, uh, similar decisions we have taken in the recent years, in recent years on the UK uh, as part of um, post Brexit uh, relationship or on Korea uh, 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 more recently, and we also know there will be a lot of uh, scrutiny and, and questions and con the conversation will be rich around a draft uh, uh, adequacy decision on the data. The privacy framework because we are coming after two judgments of the court uh, and on a very uh, complex uh, matter. So, like, looking at present, this takes basically around six months. So, sometime in spring uh, looks like a realistic uh, 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 timeline. Uh, we are not the only one uh, 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 who uh, have homework uh, uh, in the in, in, in with respect to, to this arrangement, to this deal, uh, the US uh, have to further implement, to implement what uh, the uh, uh, president instructed, that's the executive order, the president has instructed the executive branch, including the intelligence community, to do a number of things. And uh, 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 until these things uh, uh, are done, and these things are done to make those safeguards effective. And I would also say a word on this and why this is important. And that's, of for instance, includes um, designating uh, the EU uh, as a jurisdiction uh, that benefits from the new redress mechanism. Uh, it's about uh, uh, its, and the executive order uh, addresses that point. Uh, each and every intelligence agency in the US, and there are many of them, have now to review their internal rules and policies to make sure they reflect the safeguards uh, 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 provided uh, under the executive order, what is generally referred to as necessity and proportionality. What, when data has to be collected and to what extent, essentially what necessity and proportionality is about in the area of national security. That's important because the value of this deal and of this data goes beyond the adequacy decision. The safeguards in the area of government access have been negotiated so that they cover all transfers from the EU to the US, regardless of the mechanism or the transfer mechanism used. Don't know if you have already discussed this, but it's generally part of any discussion on, the, on these matters. The, the post Schwemm II landscape has been a landscape marked by a certain uncertainty because companies had to assess themselves, had to do, how to carry out what is often called a transfer impact assessment. Uh, and uh, they were trying to figure out whether. Uh, uh, safeguards in other jurisdictions, in this case the US, were sufficient, uh, or whether uh, additional safeguards 
uh, had to be added uh, to the use of certain technology, to uh, uh, other uh, 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 legal or other protections. Well, once uh, the uh, safeguards uh, that are contained in the executive order will be in place, uh, any company will be able to rely on them to transfer that. That's a very important, we hope that that's how we have uh, conceived it and developed it with our US counterparts. That would be a very important injection of uh, uh, legal uh, uh, certainty into, of course, uh, a, an absolutely uh, crucial element of uh, part of the US, of the transatlantic relationship. So I will not enter into the substance, probably there are four questions, and you have already discussed the substance, but that's, uh, uh, that was a uh, uh, just to. Uh, summarize uh, where we are and where we are going uh, 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 from here. And also let me, I, I want of course to uh, uh, um, say uh, uh, say how happy I am to be uh, with uh, such cool panelists, but I want to say a special hi to Chris, who has of course been my partner uh, in uh, um, a large part of this negotiation. Uh, he left me too early, uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, and he left me in a difficult situation, so I'm happy to see him. But still, uh, 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 but uh, I just want to say uh, and uh, how uh, important because a negotiation is also a negotiation between human beings. It's about abstract uh, 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 legal standards, abstract in a court judgment, but very real on the ground and very important. Uh, in terms of protection of uh, citizens' rights, but it's also about uh, how, uh, in, in such negotiation, two systems uh, speak to each other, find a way to, on the one hand, fulfill the court's uh, requirements on our side, but also developing a, a system that is workable in the US. And this is impossible to solve if you don't have all the human energy, human creativity, uh, and engagement and, uh, uh, that uh, we had uh, in this talks, and that's of course about human beings. And one of these human beings uh, uh, was was Chris. So I'm very happy to, to see him again in the class. Fantastic, thank you, Bruno. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get a chance to the Q and A for for yourself and, and Chris to, to respond to some questions. And um, I suppose one thing that's come up um, on during the panel's um, opening remarks, Bruno, is that, you know, the Biden administration's new policy is an executive order rather than legislation passed by Congress. And um, from kind of your perspective or the Europe's perspective, does this make it, you know, reversing or changing the policy easier for a future president? And would this be significant in the European courts who might interpret it as a weaker level of protection? There was a problem with the order. Is your question about executive order versus yes. Yes. legislation? Yes. So, um, indeed, that's a question I often uh, uh, hear, and I'm often trying to answer. Uh, what was important for us was the substance. And the substance was about getting safeguards that are binding and that are enforceable. So, that's what the court is, 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 is asking us. Uh, safeguards around necessity and proportionality, so around, again, around in which situation can government access data for national security purpose, and when data is accessed, to what extent data is accessed, necessity and proportionality. And that those safeguards should, of course, be binding on the intelligence community and invocable by Europeans if somebody uh, uh, thinks, considers that uh, his or her data is in violation of such a that's what we need to achieve. Your question is about the paper, whether this safeguard should be provided by legislation or by executive action, in this case, an executive order. Our answer to that is that that depends on the system we are uh, 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 talking about. The US system, and it's not the only system in, 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 uh, on this planet uh, like this, uh, is a presidential system. In a uh, such system, a number of uh, powers, competences in the area of foreign affairs, of national security, in particular foreign intelligence, belong to the executive branch and in particular to the president as head of the executive branch and uh, as a commander in chief. And this is not just a, a nice uh, uh, 
lesson uh, lecture about comparative constitutional law. This is how the US system is structured and how many of the rules that govern collection of data by intelligence agency are today, even before this executive order, governed by executive text, executive orders or other. Therefore, if we want to change the legal situation, add safeguards, have an impact. That's again the point about not only in abstract fulfilling certain requirements, but making sure that those requirements are effective and are, are, are workable in a certain legal system. Uh, we needed to use that same vehicle, which is uh, the uh, 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 an executive vehicle, uh, uh, because many of the rules uh, are uh, again provided uh, by, especially in the area of foreign intelligence. Are, are already set in executive text. And that's why uh, uh, that vehicle has been uh, chosen. Uh, there's, there's always a risk that a legal system may change, um, including when perhaps legislation. Legislation is also, can also be uh, uh, revoked, amended, et cetera. And it will be an important, it will be very important that this new deal, and that's what we are going to propose next week, uh, uh, provides uh, for uh, um, uh, the possibility to react uh, to such changes. And that's what uh, all our adequacy decisions uh, provide for, because when you're taking an adequacy finding, you're always taking an adequacy finding uh, uh, on a, you're taking a snapshot of a certain legal system at a certain point of time. And therefore, you also have to have tools that address possible future divergence. And, uh, those tools uh, will, of course, be included. Uh, in uh, the uh, uh, adequacy decision we we'll table next, next 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 week. Thank you, um, and I suppose that I might direct the next one to, to Christopher, but um, Bruno, you might come in as well. Um, so Christopher, as, as Bruno mentioned, the, the importance of human relationships and how positive the relationships and interactions between the EU and US negotiation teams uh, were. Um, but was there any sense of frustration maybe on, on the US side towards the EU and the perception that the EU has been excessively intransigent uh, on this issue or that the US has been unfairly singled out relative to other countries? <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks, Una. Um, Bruno, it is genuinely uh, great to see you. Uh, I'm very happy to see you again. Um, uh, and I I share the respect that, that Bruno so kindly mentioned um, uh, about Bruno. Um, and I, I think Bruno is a superhuman for, for lasting through so many international negotiations with so many different countries for so long. So uh, I'm impressed. I'm sorry I couldn't, I couldn't do it, um, but very glad that we came to a political agreement before, um, before I took off back to the private sector. Um, it, no, no. I, I mean, negotiations are frustrating, um, and Bruno is a fantastic negotiator, but he is not a terribly frustrating one. Uh, there, <laughs> there, some personalities are are challenging uh, out there in the world, um, and, and I don't think that the, despite the fact that that you know everybody gets frustrated in negotiations sometimes. I think that there were such smart people um, and such people who are trying to, on both sides trying to come up with real solutions and not trying to hide things from each other. Um, that's just where the, the tone of the conversation, the, the administration, the, the world that we're in, that's how this negotiation went. I, I can't speak for the original Privacy Shield 1 negotiation um, uh, or, or Safe Harbor, uh, but um, but this one was, though very, very difficult, it was, was not difficult because of the people involved. Um, I might have a question there, maybe Bruno, but Anne Marie also to get your uh, perspective on. Um, and I suppose, you know, what the, the implication of what happens with the EU US framework um, is for other EU data transfer relationships, I suppose, the, the implication of that. And I suppose to what degree are, are Bruno and Anne Marie watching possible developments in the United Kingdom and possible future UK divergence from GDPR protections? So, uh, am I opening a hornet's nest by asking that question? <laughs> Uh, 
Um, I, I can go first on that one. Yes, we are watching that um, very closely. So obviously we have the adequacy decision currently. Um, Bruno has alluded to the fact that they are a snapshot. It's a point in time. Um, there's the mechanism inbuilt into GDPR for review of adequacy decisions. Um, so that will be reviewed as will all of the other adequacy decisions in due course. Um, yeah, the, the, there, there are certainly, I think, some concerns that if they substantially diverge from current UK GDPR, which is essentially the same as EU GDPR, um, that that adequacy decision won't be renewed. Um, it depends that they, they seem to have stepped back a little bit from their original plans in terms of completely recrafting their, their privacy legislation. So I think it will depend on where they land on that and, and how quickly they land on that. But it is certainly something that we are keeping an eye on. And, you know, certainly from a from a contract perspective, we're, we're trying to, as we did pre-Brexit, we're, we're trying to anticipate and make sure that we've mechanisms built in to relook at international transfers that go via the UK if and when that happens. Bruno, I don't know if you want to come in on that one. I think everything has been said very well by uh, uh, Marie. Um, look, um, the, I think the UK adequacy decision was 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 take, was adopted on the basis of a certain system. The UK has announced and has, by the way, tabled a, a, a new bill uh, with some uh, changes. Um, in the U new UK there have been a lot of uh, a series of different governments in a very short uh, period of time, but the current UK, a new and current UK government is, as we understand, uh, giving a, taking a second look at that um, uh, 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 bill of the proposal. What I can say is indeed what I've said before, uh, is that um, um, certain consequences are attached to certain changes. Uh, the uh, bill that was tabled in July uh, was a mix of different things, things that were purely clarification, uh, bringing things, bringing elements and explanations that before were in certain recitals to the body of text. And then there are areas, I, I would lie if I, wouldn't, I would not say that, there are areas that are raising questions uh, and, and concerns, for instance, uh, around the independence of the uh, uh, UK Data Protection Authority, the ICO around uh, certain aspects of the rule on, on international transfers to give to, to, to them. We have, of course, communicated that. Uh, we have very close contact with our uh, UK counterparts. And if uh, those uh, proposals would uh, lead to significant uh, changes, that would have an impact on an adequacy decision that has been adopted on the basis of different rules, not very different rules. Does it make that doesn't mean that every difference is problematic by nature, but significant differences will can be problematic, of course, if they have an impact on the level of protection that has been found adequate. Let me also say that the UK situation is a bit different from any other adequacy uh, process, because in an adequacy process, you have two systems that have different starting points, and that progressively, by working on adequacy, uh, uh, bring the system closer. The UK, the starting point, as we know, was a very similar, if not identical system. And then the, the challenge is about how you um, uh, how you address a possible diversion. And that's how you know that the decision has a sunset close. And we will, in any case, have to reassess the situation in the, uh, the before a deadline, which if I'm not wrong, is in June 2025 to see if the system that will exist at that time in the UK is ensuring a similar level of protection that the one we found adequate uh, uh, last year. Super, thank you. Um, so a question maybe for John and Anne-Marie. Um, could you both comment further on the business implications that uncertainty related to this to this subject has caused to businesses generally, um, especially SMEs during recent years? Um, how severe would a worst case scenario be for businesses? And I suppose particularly depending on the, the stance that Ireland's Data Protection Commission might take regarding the use of standard contractual clauses as in the meta case. John, maybe I'll start with you just on that kind of the business implications of uncertainty and Anne-Marie then. 
Yeah, sure. Um, uh, and nice to see you, Bruno, as, as well. Um, I, I mean, one thing businesses don't like is is uncertainty. I, I think I, I think it's pretty pretty um, I'm pretty on pretty firm ground saying that. And um, you know, the the reality is that yeah, I mean, the Schrems two judgment did cause uncertainty. Number one, it, it you know it took away one of the transfer mechanisms that was in particular being relied upon by small and medium sized businesses in the U.S. and and, and Europe. Um, but number two, it, I mean, it did th obviously throw into question um, the validity of of other transfer mechanisms uh, because of what the court said about you know uh, U.S. law in in this area. I mean, and that's you know one of the things that that I think both the, the commission and the, the U.S. government have, have made clear um, is that the intention of this new uh, uh, data privacy framework is that it will represent changes in U.S. law that will be applicable, obviously, for any transfer mechanism. Um, so, so that's a good thing. And I mean, I think, I mean, I guess the, the one other thing I, that, that, that I would mention is that, um, you know, the instability that that was caused um, by the invalidation of of the of the framework. I mean, it's it's arguably counterproductive to improving the protection of personal data. I think both both from a company uh, and a, and a, a policymaker standpoint. Insofar as you know, we've all had to focus on now how do you know uh, it, it, it you know there have been very complicated uh, data transfer impact assessments in in terms of. Of, of what the court said and 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 how com you know companies, but again, I would say particularly under resourced companies, are they really equipped to analyze this very complicated area of U.S. law? I mean, it's difficult. So, um, you know, uh, hopefully we will see this draft adequacy decision soon, as you suggest, Bruno. Um, and you know, it, it went it already. I think with the announce announcement of the changes in U.S. law, that 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 has you know, somewhat solidified uh, some of these other transfer mechanisms, but but we'll even have um, more, obviously, a much more um, uh, better situation once the draft adequacy decision is hopefully ratified by, by the council and blessed by other stakeholders. Um, Anne-Marie, maybe to you, just in terms of that kind of the worst case scenario, what, what that would be for businesses here. Worst case scenario would be that some of these data transfers have to stop, and, and that is a really significant business issue in terms of business continuity for organizations. Um, you know, it, it, it's not something that, you know, if you switched off data transfers overnight, it would create utter chaos, you know, um, and data transfers tend not to be, people think of them as being linear, but, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't really work that way. So that would be worst case scenario would be switching off some of these systems and leaving, you know, potentially, potentially leaving people without uh, an ability to continue their business without an ability to access their data that is sitting in one of the other jurisdictions. So I, I think it, it would be something that would cause a, a lot of angst. Um, and that is the worst case scenario. I think in terms of just generally that there's been costs involved in all of this, you know, having to do those impact assessments potentially having to pay higher fees in order to ensure that European data stays within European, you, you know, so there are different offerings out there, um, but some of them come with, at an additional cost. There's additional risk around, um, you know, claims and admin fines. So, you know, there may be insurance implications. So ultimately, a lot of this does come down to there being additional cost um, for businesses. Um, you know, there, there's, to be honest, been a lot of pragmatism, I think, in terms of the approach business has taken. They absolutely understand their obligations. They are implementing um, the, the, the transfer mechanisms, the safeguarding mechanisms, and they are, you know, looking at um, transfer impact assessments. They're, they're doing that and then they're hoping that, you know, it, it won't be them that gets into the cross crossfire or cross hairs um so that there is a there's an element of pragmatism about it but it it, it doesn't help when the downside is so significant absolutely um so john one one question that that you you, you might 
you might smile at. Um, I suppose you've commented that you know the executive order has led to to, to legal changes in the US. Um, you know the question is, would it be true to say that EU law and the, the negotiation process has actually improved privacy rights for US citizens in a way that otherwise might not have happened? Um, is this an example of the EU standard setting influence? Bruno says yes. <laughs> No, I haven't said anything. <laughs> no, no, no. Bruno, did you want to take that one? No. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, so I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this this question. I mean, has has this whole process actually improved privacy rights for 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 U.S. citizens? Um, I mean, I guess I would I, I, I would say this. Um, I, you know, I, I mean, first of all, it's the U.S. citizens have privacy rights. I mean, just to, just to clarify that, what we don't have in in the U.S. is a you know a comprehensive federal privacy law. Certainly, my organization, I think industry writ large, um, certainly the, the the U.S. many in the U.S. government, I think support such a law. I mean, I I would say that one of the things that I think is a positive of 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 this whole um, uh, exercise, right, and the necessity of having this negotiation. Um, and, and and even the the executive order itself, and, and this might also answer another question that I had seen in the in, in the chat. You know, the executive order, as we've talked about, it's it it represents binding and enforceable legal changes on the U.S. side, um, right? But it but it also expressed some very important policy in that executive order as well, regarding both privacy, um, you know, and 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 the fact that U.S. signals intelligence authorities must consider. The legitimate privacy interests of all persons, regardless of their nationality or country of rev of residence, and you know this notion that all persons have legitimate privacy interests in the handling of their personal info that is now you know it, I mean it is it is reiterated now in this new U.S. law. So I think from that standpoint, it is you know reinforcing the importance of these privacy of uh, privacy protections not only to to U.S. citizens but but to EU citizens and citizens around the world, number one. I mean, the other thing that I would say, because someone had asked about the, you know, the U.S. intelligence community and whatnot, but, you know, the the, the policy expressed in the executive order also makes it clear that, that the idea and, and the goal of U.S. signals intelligence activities is, of course, to protect U.S. national security, but also to protect the security of allies and partners, including, including the EU. You know, I, I think we have all seen how important that you know that that is that you know this this kind of collected co collective goal of protecting national security on behalf of you know democratic partners and allies over the past couple of years and, and i just think that that's you know so I, I think that's one of the reasons both privacy and national security why it has not been difficult to answer the question in the chat to get the u.s government uh, and others to focus on this issue there's been a, a ton of focus and a ton of work which i'm sure chris and bruno could both um, attest to over the last couple of years maybe two short thoughts about this. First, it's diff in this time, we are not talking here about privacy in the, in, 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 in the, in the sense we generally uh, think about it. We're talking about a very specific area, extremely important, which, is, which are the limitations, safeguards, conditions under which government can access data, uh, in this case, for national security purposes, government in, 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 in intelligence agencies. Let me say first, it's difficult to answer to your questions, because it's difficult to compare the two situations. Because in the US, there are protections in these areas that are available only to US citizens and US permanent residents. And the, the whole challenge here was to build a system that uh, extends some protection, creates some protections uh, uh, for in the area of national security uh, when data uh, is collected about foreigners, including some of us <laughs> uh, uh, in this call. So, the big, and I think John was pointing to certain aspects of the executive order, is that it's very important that here we're talking about universal protections, protections that apply across the board, regardless of nationality, which in the digital, which in a lot of these uh, uh, legal authorities were, were, were developed uh, in, in, in times where uh, intelligence was not so much reliant on data, which is in the first place collected for other purposes commercial purposes. And therefore, in this, in this uh, globalized world, these differences based on nationality and residence makes much less sense than probably uh, 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 they, they, they have. They were uh, 
several decades ago. So this universal uh, uh, approach to rights and to privacy rights, I think, is a very important element and a very important improvement for us. But there's also a second aspect, which is actually an encouraging aspect. Um, unfortunately, I've been dealing with these issues now for, for some years. And what I've noticed in my own personal uh, journey uh, is that issues around privacy have become much less ideological. I mean, the, this co the conversation on privacy between the US and the EU has become much less ideological. We might not always agree. We might uh, disagree on how to get to certain outcomes, but there's increasing understanding, both in the commercial area, and that's why you see all these debates in, in, in the US around privacy legislation at federal level will ever happen, but also in this area, uh, uh, an increasing understanding that we need rules of the game when it comes to the uh, collection, use, responsible use of that. That's, yeah, I joined this planet of privacy when we were doing the GDPR and we were trying to explain into the US why we were doing that. We were told, we haven't understood anything, uh, it's outdated, nobody cares about privacy, uh, let the industry uh, uh, set some set some plan. This has changed, completely changed. And it makes our life a lot easier when we have to discuss and uh, 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 make progress, for instance, in, in, this, in this negotiation. And it's also, uh, there's a lot of potential on that because when the US and the EU can agree on something, here, privacy, that has a significance that goes beyond the bilateral relationship. Um, I think the US is also very interested in this issue because it, it sees privacy as a component, an element of that dividing line between like-minded democracy and other systems around the world, which have a very different way of approaching issues around, around data, around, uh, you know, around government access to that. And, and I think that's part of the broader uh, picture and background. And that's also why while developing this deal, we have also been able to advance. And with next week is the week of all deals because next week at the, the OECD Digital Ministerial will announce the adoption of a new instrument on a set of principles on governance access to that. Wouldn't surprise you that the uh, amongst the many hands uh, and voices that have participated to this uh, work, the US and the EU ones were probably uh, the most important ones. Not because they are smarter than the others, but because they have a lot of experience in discussing this issue and finding bridges uh, between the other And uh, 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 the OECD uh, 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 document the instrument that will be adopted this week is unprecedented. It's, at the it's the first time at international level that countries come together uh, 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 to define a set of uh, requirements, principles that apply to the way a government, government access that. In the area of law enforcement, in the area of national security, etc. That's important because it's key to uh, again inject trust to data flows and therefore trade. And it's also important to show that we need to do this. Government needs to access data, but we do it in a way uh, and with certain safeguards that are different, very different uh, from the way adults uh, do it. Uh, and that, I think, shows very much the potential there is. Uh, on uh, 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 when uh, the EU and, 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 the, and the US agree on something and how this can indeed shape international standards. And that would not have been possible probably even five or six years ago. That I think shows the evolution and it's a positive one. Well, that's a fantastic uh, point, Bruno, and a fantastic summary and note to, to leave this uh, webinar on. Uh, we've gone over time, but um, fantastic discussion, really, really um, good responses to all uh, the questions and, and the dialogue between you all. So I really just want to um, express my sincere thanks to all our guest speakers for really sharing their expertise and insights with us. Um, it's an exciting space, there's a lot happening, um, but it's fantastic to see, I think, the, the positive note that, that we're ending on there. Um, so we look forward to, to seeing the progress that comes um, over, over the coming months on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, also, sincere thanks to IDA Ireland and to IIA for, for organising uh, this series of events. Um, thank you once again to everyone who joined us on, online and on the live stream. Um, hope to see you again next week. Take care. Thanks so much. Thank you.